page 24. The last type of thermometer we're going to discuss in this unit is a pyrometer. And the word pyro means heat. So a pyrometer is literally something that measures heat. And the word is occasionally used synonymously with thermometer, but more commonly the term refers to an instrument for measuring high temperatures. And pyrometers are based on electromagnetic radiation. Now there's a short, very short chapter, the next chapter on heat transfer in the notes, only a couple pages, and we need to look at that now to get a background on electromagnetic radiation. So if you switch to heat transfer, it starts on page 40. So on page 40, heat transfer. The transfer of energy as heat occurs in practically every industrial process. For example, we have the heat of reaction. We have heat exchangers, where heat transfer is due to a difference in temperature. We have distillation, where we have the heat of vaporization. There's heats of dilution and solution occurring as we solubilize certain chemicals. Heat is referred to as energy, which is transferred by means of a temperature difference. It's always from a hot body to a cold body. It makes no sense to speak about heat in a system. Heat flow only occurs when energy is transferred, just as work only occurs as energy is transferred. According to the kinetic molecular theory, temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of molecules in an object. So remember the last time you touched the burner of a stove or the hot plate or a hot beaker and burned yourself a little bit? What actually happened was the molecules of the beaker or stove burner were traveling very quickly and they caused the molecules of your skin to move very quickly and that caused some discomfort. What about the units of heat? Well, there are calories, or joules or British thermal units, BTUs. One calorie is the amount of heat required to raise one gram of water by one Celsius degree. You may not realize that a calorie is not an exact unit by itself. Uh, we need to define the temperature of the water that's being changed. For example, at 14 and a half to 15 and a half degrees Celsius, the one calorie is equivalent to 4.184 joules, and this is called the thermochemical calorie. But that value would be slightly different at different water temperatures. Are you aware that a dietary calorie is actually a kilocalorie? Yes, a thousand calories. The dietary calories you read about on food information, they're actually kilocalories. And it's said that if you want to lose a kilogram of weight, you have to burn approximately 7,000 calories. That'd be 7,000,000 ,000 calories, or 7 million calories. No wonder it's so difficult to lose weight. Good information to know, right? We've already mentioned that a BTU is the amount of heat required to raise a pound of water, one Fahrenheit degree. And we've discussed heat capacity or specific heat already in this course. How about this? Let's convert one BTU to joules. Let's give that a shot. So we're going to say how many joules is equal to one BTU. How will we do that? Well, up here I see that we're given a conversion between calories and BTUs. So let's do that. Let's go from BTUs to calories. There's 252 calories in BTU. And we just talked about the relationship between uh, calories and joules. There were 4.184 joules per calorie. So we could do that in two conversions. We'll cancel out BTUs. Go to calories. One BTU, 252 calories then we can convert from calories to joules. One calorie, 4.184 joules. I'll have some units cancelling here. We'll wind up with joules. And you work that out, that's 
1054 joules per BTU. There are three modes of heat transfer which we need to think about conduction, convection, and radiation. Page 41, please. Right, so on page 41, we're looking at conduction, convection, and radiation. So how do they differ? How are they the same? Conduction is heat energy transferred by molecular collisions of vibrating molecules without measurable displacement of the particles in the conducting medium. In other words, the particles of a solid, particularly, to a lesser extent, in a liquid. But in a solid, they're not free to move and they can vibrate and collide with each other. It's analogous to firefighters transferring water via a bucket brigade. That would be people or molecules vibrating in place while water, heat energy, is being passed along in buckets. And conduction is the primary method of heat transfer in solids where molecules are close together uh, and collide as they vibrate in place. And among solids, metals are the best thermal conductors as well as the best electrical conductors because their electrons are free to move about and transfer energy. Let's compare that with convection. Convection is transfer of heat from one point to another within a fluid. So fluid is either a gas or a liquid, or between a fluid and a solid, or a fluid and another fluid by movement of the molecules in the fluids. So high energy molecules are free to move in fluids and in so doing they can carry thermal energy to other locations. This would be analogous to the firefighters carrying pails of water rather than just passing them along. Some examples, winds and ocean currents are examples of natural convection. Now the driving force for natural convection is gravity or buoyancy. You know that hot fluids are less dense than cold fluids, so hot fluids rise while cold fluids sink. Likewise, hot air and smoke rising up a chimney is due to natural convection. In industry, we use a lot of forced convection. That's the transfer of heat by motion of a fluid that's driven by mechanical means like pumps or fans or mixers or bubblers. And finally, we have radiation. Radiation is the transfer of heat by absorption or emission of radiant energy, like a heat lamp. Perhaps you've seen heat lamps in restaurants keeping food warm. Dull red glow. So radiant energy is electromagnetic radiation, and thus, like visible light, it travels through a vacuum and through some transparent materials. Most objects above absolute zero are constantly emitting radiant energy to its surroundings and also constantly absorbing as radiant energy falls upon it. And the absorbed rays are converted into energy, usually internal energy, as evidenced by a temperature rise. Page 42. We'll discuss the electromagnetic spectrum more back in our chapter on thermometry. I want to wrap up this short little chapter with a discussion of the Duar flask. So a Duar flask is a laboratory thermos. And like a thermos, it's a double-walled vessel. The outer and inner walls have mirrored surfaces and are separated by an evacuated space. And the two layers contact each other only at the neck of the flask, which is sealed with an insulating device such as a rubber stopper or cork. Here's a picture of the mirrored surface that's on the inner and outer surfaces of the duar. So, just one question here. Discuss the three methods of heat transfer with respect to a duar flask. Since the space between the inner and outer walls is evacuated, there's no solid or liquid or gas to bring about conduction or convection. And furthermore, the surfaces are mirrored, so that eliminates radiation. The only point of contact is that the rubber stopper, and that's well insulated. We use duars at the college to store liquid nitrogen. A liquid nitrogen boils at minus 196 Celsius. It would not stick around very long in a regular thermos. 
but industrial doors are very good at insulating. In fact, we can keep liquid nitrogen in a door for at least three weeks, possibly four weeks, at room temperature storage in a door. All right, so that's all we need from this chapter. Subsequent pages, five through seven, are not required for this course at this time. So let's go back to our thermometry notes. Take a look at this image of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we start off at the low energy end, long wavelength, radio waves and TV waves, up to a kilometer long, it's quite long. We're moving it from low energy, low frequency and high wavelength towards higher frequency, higher energy and shorter wavelength. Microwaves and then infrared. We can just barely see some of the infrared spectra, humans. And to the visible range, then ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma ray, very high energy, high frequency, short wavelength, very damaging, very, very lethal really to humans, unless of course your name happens to be Dr. David Banner. All right, so brief mention, there are three classes of pyrometers. Some measure all wavelengths of incident light and they're referred to as total radiation pyrometers. A second class of pyrometer is called an optical pyrometer. It measures a narrow band of radiation in the vicinity of the visible infrared spectra. Then there are partial radiation pyrometers that are fairly selective in the wavelengths they measure. They operate on the photoelectric principle. That is a photosensitive material will emit a current in proportion to the intensity and wavelength of incident light. You're not required to learn the different kinds. I simply wanted to mention them to you. Our own eyes serve as a form of pyrometer. We recognize a dull red color as a temperature somewhere near 500 Celsius and darker reds a little hotter. Orange is in the oh, 900 Celsius temperature range. Yellow is close to a thousand ish temperature range and when you get white hot well that's close to 1500 Celsius. Let's look at page 25. So here's how one older style optical pyrometer might work. Incident light travels through a lens or objective and focuses it, directs it through a filter, typically a red filter, and then a final eyepiece to the observer. At the same time we have a filament in the light path that filament is illuminated by directing current through it. So here's a DC power supply and a rheostat. A rheostat is a variable resistor. So the operator on this older style pyrometer would turn the dial, adjusting the resistance, creating more or less current to go through the filament. With more light going through the filament of the light bulb, it glows brighter. With less, it grows redder and less brighter. And so the operator would adjust the rheostat until the color of the filament was the same as the color of the incident light and then would look at the handle of the pyrometer and that dial that you turned was calibrated in degrees Celsius. Here's an image of a sailor is measuring the temperature of a ventilation system with an, a pyrometer. These are just point and shoot. Here's a handheld image to the right that has a laser and the laser is not related to measuring the temperature it's simply telling the operator where he's pointing at. You get a reading within about a second. They're quite handy. So as mentioned already radiant energy is transmitted in the form of electromagnetic waves and visible light is just a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So there's some properties that are similar among all types of electromagnetic radiation. For example, they all travel at the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second in a vacuum, even radio waves. CO2 and water absorb large quantities of 
types of electromagnetic radiation. I think we're quite familiar with that aspect about the, the global warming blanket of CO2 and water. Air is relatively transparent to electromagnetic radiation. All substances that absorb radiation are also capable of emitting electromagnetic radiation. Radiant energy striking a body may be absorbed or reflected or passed through. So it might be best if I just show you some photographs or images as I explain this page to you. Radiant energy striking a body may be absorbed or reflected or passed through. So a mirror, like you see here, or a polished metal surface approximates a perfect reflector. Now a perfect reflector absorbs and radiates nothing. Reflection is not the same as radiation. Bodies that absorb all radiant energy are called black bodies. They are perfect absorbers. A cavity or hollow box with a small pinhole and a rough black interior surface would be the best approximation of a black body. It's absorbing everything. A porous black surface such as a handful of black soil or finely powdered charcoal would approximate a black body. If a body is placed in a container and thermal equilibrium exists between the body and the container, then the areas that are receiving energy must be emitting energy at the same rate. Equal and opposite rates is the definition of equilibrium. So think about this. You have a sample in a beaker. You put it in the oven at 100 degrees C to dry it. The temperature of the beaker and its contents rises to 100 degrees C, but then it stops rising when the temperature of the beaker is the same as that of the oven. Now that must mean that the beaker is emitting radiation at the same rate as it is absorbing it, otherwise the temperature of the beaker would continue to rise and rise and rise until the beaker melted. So all objects that absorb radiation must also emit radiation at the same rate or thermal equilibrium would not be attained. And a perfect absorber therefore must also be a perfect emitter. If a body is a black body then it must emit energy at the maximum possible rate for its temperature or equilibrium would shift to a higher temperature. If a body is non-black it absorbs only a fraction of the radiant energy and must emit the same fraction. This concept that at thermal equilibrium the emissivity of a body equals the absorptivity is known as Kirchhoff's law, which is explained on page 27. All right, so page 27. From physics we're familiar with the term power. Power is the rate at which work is done. Power is calculated as work per unit time and would have units such as calories per second joules per second or watts. A watt is defined as a joule per second. Well similarly the rate of emission of radiation is called radiant power and we'll use the symbol P and it also has units of watts. The rate at which an object emits radiation, that is its radiant power, would be directly proportional to the surface area. Larger surface area, greater rate of emission. It's also proportional to the fourth power of its Kelvin temperature. So radiant power P in watts is calculated by the following formula. P is equal to Q over T. Q is the amount of energy radiated, usually as joules. A is the surface area of the object that's emitting it, usually in meters squared. E is the emissivity, no units discuss that further in a minute. And sigma is Stefan Boltzmann's constant. It's 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per square meter per Kelvin to the fourth power. So what about emissivity? Well it's the ratio of the rate of energy emission by a body to the rate of energy emission by a perfect radiator, a black body, of the same area and temperature. And it's dimensionless. So here are some emissivity values. A black body has an emissivity of 1. Flat black paint is pretty close, 0.97. The human body is rated at 0.96. 
common brick still pretty high 0.93 even glossy white paint it still has an emissivity of pretty high value 0.91 now polished copper only 0.3 that's because it's probably reflective to some extent polished steel 0.07 now we're approaching a mirror a perfect reflector has an emissivity of zero it emits nothing but that's because it radiates nothing because it's a perfect reflector so absorptivity a is the ratio of the rate of energy absorbed by a body to the rate of energy absorbed by a black body of the same area and temperature so it turns out numerically emissivity will always be exactly the same as absorptivity and that's Kirchhoff's law now since all objects above absolute zero constantly emit radiation one might wonder why objects do not cool to absolute zero goes back to what we spoke about before bear in mind that objects are continuously absorbing radiant energy at the same rate as they are emitting it a body at the same temperature as its surroundings emits and absorbs energy at the same rate. Page 28. Right, so on page 28, this is our last page, the net rate of transfer of radiant energy between an object and its surroundings at a different temperature can be readily calculated. We'll look at this when we do a problem associated with it. I'd like to finish up this page. Note that the absorptivity and emissivity of an object is a function of the wavelength of radiation. You can't get a suntan through a glass window, but you can see through it. Do you follow what I mean? Whereas visible radiation wavelengths, 0.4 to 0.8 microns, travel through glass, UV is largely absorbed. So you see that an object's absorptivity is a function of its wavelength that varies with the wavelength. The wavelength of emitted and absorbed radiation is a function of temperature. Now let's take a look. I tried to draw it here, but I found some better illustrations on the web. We keep in mind that visible is between 4 and 0.8 microns. And then the near IR is from 0.8 to 2.5 microns. And then above 2.5, we're looking at the mid IR. So here we see an object, let's say the human body, with a surface temperature of 37 Celsius, that'd be about 310 Kelvin, represented by this lower purple line here. So our body generates radiation based on its temperature, and we're into the, well, the far IR, the mid IR, and into the near IR. Notice that this is about uh, 2 microns, and 2 microns is in the near IR. Certainly not into the visible. Uh, we can see ourselves by photographing with um, infrared film. But at 500 Kelvin, notice we're just into the dull red region, and so that'd be just visible to the human eye. Now the surface temperature of the sun is said to be around 6,000 Kelvin, and that would emit all forms of radiation right into the visible, into the UV, into the X-ray, into the gamma ray. Fortunately, the Earth's magnetic field protects us from these otherwise lethal cosmic rays. A gray body is a surface that absorbs all wavelengths with the same absorptivity and emissivity, unlike glass, for example. So what's an example of a gray body? There's a gray body. And that should be sufficient for our study of pyrometers. There are some problems on page 31 that we'll look at next. Page 31. We have four problems related to pyrometers. Problem number 20 says calculate the temperature in degrees Celsius that would cause an object with an emissivity of 0 0.5 to emit radiation at a rate of 500 watts per square meter. Let's write down what we have and we'll write down the formula. We want to know the temperature in degrees Celsius, an object with emissivity of 0.75. We're told it emits power 
at a rate of 500 watts per square meter. Here's our formula. We want to solve for temperature, so I'm going to say T to the fourth equals power divided by A E sigma. So we have the emissivity. It's given as 0.75. Stefan Boltzmann's constant is known. We need these two terms, power and area, surface area. Where is that given in the problem? Actually, it's given right here, combined. A little bit tricksy. This is actually power, which is watts, over area in square meters. It's combined. All right, let's do that. That makes it easier, doesn't it? So temperature will be the fourth root. 500 watts and divided by 1 square meter, that's P over A, times 0 0.75, emissivity has no units, times 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per square meter per Kelvin to the fourth power. So we have T is equal to the fourth root. Now this denominator works out to be 4.25 times 10 to the minus 8. So this then becomes 500. I'll deal with the units after divided by 4.25 times 10 to the minus 8, which is the fourth root of, this works out to be 1.176 times 10 to the 10, and the fourth root of that works out to be 329. Let's look at the units for a moment here. So we have watts cancel, per square meter cancels. We're left with 1 over 1 over k to the 4, which is k to the 4. So this is Kelvin's to the fourth power in parentheses here. And the fourth root of that will simply be Kelvin's. We're asked for the Celsius temperature, so we need to subtract 273. And that'll be 56 degrees Celsius. All right, let's try number 21. Number 21 says, determine the rate of energy radiated from the surface of a spherical black body if it has a diameter of 30 centimeters and it's maintained at a temperature of 1500 degrees Celsius. We're given the formula for the surface area of a sphere. Area is pi d squared. All right, let's write that down. This is number 21. Power equals A E sigma T to the fourth. We're calculating power. All right, that's straightforward. We need the area is given as pi D squared. The diameter is given as 30 centimeters. So we need that in meters. That'll be pi times 0 0.30 meters squared. And that's 0 0.2827 square meters. All right, let's put it together. Here we have P is equal to 0 0.2827 square meters times E. Now it's a black body, so its emissivity is simply 1 no units. Stefan Boltzmann's constant is 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per square meter per Kelvin to the fourth power. The temperature is given as 1500 Celsius. We need Kelvin. I'm going to add 273. That'll be 1773 Kelvin. 
to the fourth power. Take your calculators out. This works out to be 1.58 times 10 to the 5 watts. That's a lot of watts. That's actually 158 kilowatts. Well, that's it. Let's check out number 22. All right, number 22 says the tungsten filament of a light bulb has a length of 15 centimeters and a diameter of 0.15 millimeters. Its emissivity is 0.31, that's tungsten. Neglecting radiative gains, what power does it radiate at 3000 Kelvin? We're given the surface area of a cylinder is pi dl. All right, number 22. We're told the length of the filament is 15 centimeters. Its diameter is equal to 0.15 millimeters. The emissivity of tungsten was given as 0.31 and the temperature is given as 3000 and this is Kelvin this time. So we're given the formula for surface area of a cylinder is pi D L. I'm going to draw this. Here's a rather poor looking incandescent light bulb. Kind of passing out of fashion now. And the filament is wound like this as you've likely noticed. If we stretch that filament out, we're told the length is 15 centimeters, but we need that in meters, so that's 0 0.15 meters. And the diameter, we need that in meters, so 0.15 millimeters would be 0 0.00015 meters. So now the area, pi dl, will be pi times the diameter, 0 0.00015 meters, times the length of 0 0.15 meters. I get uh, 7.069 times 10 to the minus 5. And that unit would be square meters. All right, let's put that in our formula. Power equals A E sigma T to the fourth. We have 7.069 times 10 to the minus 5 square meters. The emissivity for the tungsten filament is given as 0.31. We have Stefan Boltzmann's constant, 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per square meter per Kelvin to the fourth power. We want temperature to the fourth power, that's 3000 Kelvin to the fourth power. All right, uh, take a minute, work that out. I get 101 watts, a typical 100 watt light bulb. So a 100 watt light bulb is the amount of power that it consumes. Incandescent light bulbs run very hot. If you read up on this a bit, you'll find that only about 5% of the power that's being radiated is actually visible. The other 95% is in a non-visible range. Uh, typically it's infrared, which means it's heat. And if you doubt that, just grab a hold of one for a few seconds and you'll remember very quickly that most of the energy dispensed or dispersed by an incandescent light bulb is actually heat in the infrared region, which is why it's a good move to get away from those and go towards LEDs. All right, problem number 23. We're told the filament of a light bulb maintains a temperature of 1500 Kelvin when it is supplied with 150 watts of power. What temperature would it maintain if it were supplied with 200 watts of power? Hmm, that sounds too easy. Let me write that down, 23. I'll say T1 is 
1500 Kelvin and that's uh, P1 power is 150 watts T2 is well what would that be if the power increased to 200 watts how do you think you'd solve that do you think you would just say like T2 over T1 is P2 over P1 rearrange and solve for T2 actually that's not going to work this type of formula assumes a linear relationship between whatever you're comparing are temperature and power linearly related let me write this out P2 is equal to A E sigma T to the fourth now I can divide two equations I'll write P1 is equal to A E sigma t to the fourth this is t2 t1 I can divide one equation by the other doesn't change equalities now in this case notice that it's the same light bulb so they have the same filaments so the surface area will be the same it's the same emissivity because it's the same filament and this is a constant so what's that leave us with ratio of powers is equivalent to the ratio of temperatures to the fourth power. They're not linearly related at all. So I could write T2 to the fourth power is equal to P2 over P1 times T1 to the fourth power. And I could say T2 would be the fourth root of P2 over P1 times T1 to the fourth power. I can write that as T2 is equal to T1, taking the fourth root of T to the 4 is T1, times the fourth root, this is fourth root, of P2 over P1. That's the relationship that's actually true. If I write in here 1500 Kelvin times the fourth root of 200 watts over 150 watts, that's the relationship that's true. T2 is equal to 1500 Kelvin times. Now, in the fourth radical, yeah, I've worked out, this becomes 1.075, which works out to be 1612 Kelvin. Now, considering the number of sig figs present, I'm going to chop one off there and just write it as 1610 Kelvin. So, actually, if you were to plot the relationship between uh, temperature versus power, power being independent, you would actually have something that looks more like this, right? certainly not linear so it can't be treated in a linear fashion so that's it for the problems related to pyrometers given the abbreviated semester I'm going to dispense with these thermometer calibration problems and that'll be it for this unit on thermometry